Good morning, everyone. My name is Phyllis Santry. I'm in the class of 66. In my role as chair of the Pembroke Center Associates Council, I'd like to welcome you to this commencement forum, Crisis, Policies to Strengthen a Troubled Economy. We will be discussing the current state of the U.S. economy and the prospects for recovery. Today's forum is sponsored by the Pembroke Center Associates, a group of alumni and friends who support the Pembroke Center for Research and Teaching on Women. And now, let's turn our program over to our moderator, Jill Schlesinger. Thank you. Thanks so Thank you all for coming out on our rainy morning, and it'll be beautiful when you leave. I promise that, because look at these two brilliant people. Notice that the only one who doesn't have an advanced degree is the one who gets to moderate. This is a brilliant little marketing play on my part. Uh, starting this process is really interesting because when we look at a crisis like we are enduring or have endured, there are, I always think, a couple different ways to go about it. You could say, let's look at the absolute worst thing that happened and how are we going to really like not have let that happen again and, and focus on all the negative, but you can also po focus on some of the positive. And so maybe a little bit of optimism and pessimism is good here. This would be a good way to kind of start the program. We're not going to make it all dour and bad. We're not going to delve in too much into the past. We do want to be optimistic. And this reminded me of a friend of mine who is uh, from Bulgaria. <laughs> OK, so what does Bulgaria have to do with markets? Well, I'm going to tell you why. He said to me, you Americans are very pessimistic. You, you, we, we Bulgarians are pessimistic, and you Americans are very optimistic. And it's very funny. He escaped after, under the Iron Curtain. It was really a really pretty impressive story. He said, let me tell you about how pessimistic you can be sometimes if you're from Bulgaria. This is a story about the Bulgarian pessimist meets the optimist in the street. And the pessimist comes up, and he says, oh, things cannot get worse. And the optimist says, no. Things can get worse. <laughs> so on that note, let's figure out how we're going to be a little more optimistic about this. <laughs> Always start with a joke, so my girlfriend tells me. OK, you know the story, perfect storm of events that have converged to help foster a housing and a credit bubble. Families bought houses they couldn't have afforded and lived without interest rates being so low. Speculators bought properties to flip. People with modest incomes and poor credit assume mortgages designed for sketchy buyers, those subprime ones, the interest only, Alt-A. On Wall Street, a huge market evolved in subprime mortgage bonds. Those are the securities backed by the streams of payments from other mortgages. Banks and other mortgage lenders relaxed their credit standards, knowing that many of the loans they issued would be bunched together into securities and sold to investors. Lots of, lots of, lots of leverage to increase their returns. And what helped set the stage for that bubble besides plain old greed and bubble mentality? Well, maybe it was a nearly two-decade move towards financial deregulation. That's what some people think. Politicians, industry insiders all resisted calls for higher government oversight, and they didn't want to really get involved in these complex securities. Randy's old boss in 2005, Alan Greenspan, said in, uh, this was talking about subprime lending, where once more marginal applicants would simply have been denied credit, lenders are now able to quite efficiently judge the risks posed by individual applicants and to price that risk appropriately. Well, maybe not that much. So, <laughs> and I'd also like to mention, I got to the board in 2006. Yeah, that's after right. Alan right Greenspan here. had that's left. That's good, so. right here. I like that. <laughs> so, so set the record straight. None of his fault. It wasn't his boss at the time. So, the, what's interesting is, listen, there's always been lots of financial crises have occurred in this country, and about a dozen I counted up since the end of World War II, and the aftermath of, of those crises was, you saw markets rebound pretty quickly. This current crisis appears to be different. Will it usher in a profound and lasting structural, behavioral, and regulatory change? Uh, Niall Ferguson recently said this in the Financial Times. Financial crises are more often caused by bad regulation than by deregulation. So the financial and credit crisis has stirred the regulatory pot. Here's what's cooking. <laughs> Obama administration is actively discussing the creation of a regulatory commission that would protect consumers who use financial products like mortgages, credit cards, and mutual funds. 
Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner has announced that he wants a, quote, super regulator, and you get like a big S on your chest if you're that super regulator. You'd be responsible for overseeing systemic risk. Geithner said that, quote, this financial crisis was caused in large part by significant gaps in the oversight in markets, end quote. He didn't actually say, and I was part of that because I was at the New York Fed, but he was. The passage of the Fraud Enforcement and Recovery Act establishes the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. That's going to examine the causes of the financial crisis and will be fashioned after the famous PCORA Commission of the 1930s. Now, you, if you're not a student of financial and market history, you might want to know that PCORA, this commission was dynamite. Set the stage for the following. The Banking Act of 1933, which established the FDIC. The Securities Act of 1933, which laid out disclosure and anti-fraud rules. The Securities Act of 1934, which created the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now that is a result-oriented commission, I'll tell you. <laughs> so now the financial world has become more complex. We are entering into new uncharted territory on regulation. And as Washington clamors for a response to this crisis, we have these two fantastic experts here. And we want to know what is regulation going to look in economy 2.0. So the first question that I am going to pose to Annette and Randy, and you know, we're going to kind of make this a little free flowing here, so we'll jump in. And if there's some sort of celebrity death match that goes on between them, I will. <laughs> you know. So here's the first one. It's going to be real open ended. So Annette, what do you see as the top priorities to address the current situation and prevent the crisis from recurring? That's an easy one. To start. That's really easy. Really easy. Well, I'd like to start off by saying that a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, mm -hmm. and um, we're in a situation here where we have a unique opportunity to address a number of flaws in our regulatory system that uh, have become apparent in the recent past. When you stop and think about how much markets have changed in the last 75 years, and what Jill just talked about was the last time we really thought about the structure of regulation after the PCORA commissions in the 1930s, that's really remarkable. I mean, think about all the other things in your life that have changed. I mean, you know, you're talking about computerization and, and, and all of the other things that have happened, and yet our structure is very much in the same mode. So there's a tremendous opportunity here to rethink the regulatory structure. Um, you asked about deregulation. I mean, I, I think Randy and I come out a little on slightly different sides of that equation, um, and I tend to be somewhat more regulatory, I think, by design, but the, I do think that um, we have to rethink regulation very much. We have to uh, take all of the regulatory agencies that we have today and really rethink what their functions are. I think that Secretary Geithner's focus on a systemic risk regulator is the place to start. Uh, Jill talked about you know, the S on their chest. I think a target is more like <laughs> um, The notion, frankly, that any one regulator is going to be able to be all-seeing and all-knowing is a little bit naive. That having been said, you have to start somewhere. And so I think the, uh, the concept that you would have one agency, and it, I think it's likely that it would be the Federal Reserve, who would get inputs from all over the economy and including inputs from the other, what we call functional regulators, the regulators of the particular uh, financial functions such as securities, insurance, banking, take all those data points and see if they can predict what I, I suspect will be 20 of the next two crises, um, uh, I think is, is going to be essential. I think that concept is also um, taking hold uh, across the globe. Um, there are a number of um, things also though that, that are in the mix about regulatory reform that trouble me uh, a bit. Um, one of them is the fact that uh, there is talk about a financial markets Safety Commission. And it, that concept sort of resonates with people because they understand what the Consumer Product Safety Commission does. And they say, well, if we, you know, if we have an agency that makes sure that my toaster's not going to blow up, why shouldn't we have an agency that makes sure that my financial product isn't going to blow up in my face or, or result in dramatic losses in my bank account? And I completely appreciate that and believe that that function is critical. I happen to believe that we've had an agency 
that for the last 75 years, with some exceptions of you know having, having obviously failed uh, on occasion, but we've had an agency for the last 75 years that actually was the most respected agency in the world with respect to investor protection, and that's the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the notion that you would somehow separate out investor protection, which is so integral to the SEC's role, and to separate that out from the other functions that the SEC is so, uh, that are so integral to its role, such as um, disclosure and transparency and accounting oversight. You can't really split those things. You can't say, well, this is what you have to do when you talk to people, but we're going to have another place where they determine what it is that you're told, what are the, what are the responsibilities to tell investors um, about particular products and the risks. So I happen to think that what we really need is an SEC 2.0. We really need to, to think about what are um, all the functions that you would want a regulatory agency that oversees investment products to do. And another problem I think that we had over the course of time, uh, and it's because of financial innovation, is that you've seen tremendous convergence of products across these different business lines. So very often you can buy a product from a bank that's quite similar to what you would buy from a broker dealer, yet the rules about what you have to be told and, and um, you know, what the disclosures are and how, you know, what you understand about that and the sales practices are different. And that's inexplicable. They're only different because in 1930, those roles were very different. In, in the 1930s, banks were places that took deposits. They didn't sell investment products. And thus, there's been a convergence of, the, of really what the Fed requires and what the SEC requires in the sale of investment products. There's no reason for that to be uh, the case today. I think if you were really seizing the opportunity of this financial crisis, you would rethink what those roles are, and you would, you would divide them differently, and you would have similar rules apply to all financial products, whether they are annuities that are sold as insurance products, whether they're you know, banking products, or, or whether they are securities products. And um, I think that that's really critical. I always say, my mother's sitting in the front here, I always say uh, to people at the SEC, it makes no sense to me that you should have to have a law degree to understand what your rights are as an investor and what you should expect from your intermediary as an investor. So for instance, even within the SEC, the responsibilities of somebody who is an investment advisor are different than the responsibilities of someone who is your broker. And that makes no sense. You, should have, you shouldn't have to know that the person you're dealing with is under one regulatory regime or the other. One is a fiduciary, the other has, you know, know your customer and, um, and uh, suitability. suitability requirements. And there are, sub there are subtle differences but they should be completely irrelevant to you as an investor. And if I could pop in here, I just won the bet on when the word fiduciary would be uh, <laughs> mentioned first, so I'm thank you, thankful for that. I'll expect my baseball cap soon. Uh, you know, Annette brings up a very interesting point. It's one that's dear to my heart. And if everyone wants to wake up at uh, 8 o'clock on Monday morning, I'll be talking about it on the early show, that, uh, you know, you, you are actually entitled as a consumer to ask people questions, right? You know, so if Annette is my broker, I'm allowed to say, well, are you putting my interest first or are you putting your interest first? So uh, I just want to remind everyone, ask a lot of questions. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> jumping off point. Um, the fiduciary means they, the person selling you product has to actually put your interest before his or his company's and has to tell you lots of stuff that maybe a broker that doesn't have to. So, Randy, here's the easy one for you. <laughs> Don't I get to tell my priorities first? You're going to. <laughs> oh, I okay. want to get into that. So, I want to, I want you to, so we're going to talk about your priorities, but I want maybe if you could also talk about it in terms of, you know, everyone in this audience is not uh, necessarily in the business, but, you know, you might not realize all the different regulators that exist, right? We have states that, that regulate. Uh, Anyone here from the Rhode Island regulator? Anyone here? Great, I can speak freely. Uh, so you have states, you have FINRA, you have the SEC, you have the Federal Reserve, you have the OCC, you have OTS, you have FDIC. Everyone has regulatory powers. And when you're framing your response to what we could do, I also would like you to maybe touch on how you think those, all those parties, those bodies can work together. Can we streamline sure. some of this? It seems crazy. 
Sure, and I think Annette was, was addressing that, uh, that very important issue. First, I just want to say how delighted I am to be here. Something that I don't think was mentioned in, in the introduction, this is my 25th reunion at Brown, and I'd like to thank uh, members of the class of 84 who are here. And the Pembroke Center wants to thank Randy for his generous gift. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I think my mother's calling me. I have to go. And, uh, and also, uh, this, was, uh, this was a room in which I had one of my favorite classes at Brown. It was not an economics class or an applied math class or history class, all of which I had studied here, uh, but uh, it was actually art history. Uh, there was a great class by William Jordy, Art and Architecture in uh, the 20th century. And uh, it was one of my, my, favorite, uh, my favorite classes, so I'm, I'm actually delighted to be up here and also looking out and seeing people not yet falling asleep where I was usually uh, asleep. <laughs> He'd lower the lights, put up the, uh, the pictures of Le Corbusier buildings and other things, and it was very easy in the back to sort of uh, nod off. But uh, as I said, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and, and um, I, I very much agree with, with Annette that thinking about uh, streamlining, the, uh, uh, streamlining the, the regulatory system is extremely important because I think it's some of those regulatory gaps that cause some of the problems that, uh, that we had today. And so I also agree with Secretary Geithner that it's important to, uh, to do that. But I also agree with uh, Neil Ferguson that sometimes it's those gaps, those problems in regulation that can cause some of the, the troubles that, uh, that, that we've seen. And I think one of the areas uh, that, uh, that we really have to rethink is uh, the resolution of uh, financial institutions. Because exactly as, uh, as Annette and, uh, and Jill were saying, if you look back to the 1930s when we did the last major rethink of regulation, banks were the only game in town. And so uh, most, of the, uh, most of the regulations, deposit insurance, resolution regimes for deposit insurance, for, uh, for deposits, for banks, were, it was all focused on banking institutions. But now there are a lot of other players that are producing very similar type of products. And also, banks are just not as big as they used to be. You've got hedge funds, you've got investment banks. Well, we don't have independent investment banks anymore. That was some of the emergency powers that we exercised in that one, one weekend in mid-September that gave, uh, gave uh, commercial bank charters to, uh, to some of the large investment banks, uh, God rest their souls. And, uh, and so we really need to, to acknowledge that the markets have changed dramatically, and also that they're likely to continue to evolve. So rather than have a regulatory system that is kind of stuck in a particular institutional framework, realize that it will change, and also realize that it's going to change with re, uh, precisely because of the regulations. Markets are always going to try to slip around some of the regulations, try to um, uh, ease, ease, them, ease their burdens, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that and realize that that's part of the regulatory process, this kind of, uh, this kind of back and forth. And one of the things that, that I saw the Fed was perhaps one of the most problematic things that I would put as a particularly high priority is the resolution regime for non-bank financial institutions. And I saw this so clearly with that, that, uh, uh, that, that week when all of the investment banks were facing incredible challenges last mid-September. Uh, None of them really thought that they, uh, they would be able to make it through to, uh, to the next week. And, and part of the pressures coming from that were uncertainties in the bankruptcy regime. So there were custodial accounts, that is, people had their own money just kept on account with you know, their savings with someone, not a bank, but an investment bank. But they were afraid that if the institution went down, they'd have to go through litigation, they'd have to wait to get the money back. Same thing with people who had brokerage accounts there, especially thing, institutions like hedge funds or large institutional investors. They didn't want their accounts frozen for an hour, for a day, maybe for a year. They couldn't wait. And so what was happening is the business model was imploding and all because of uncertainties in the bankruptcy system. I shouldn't say all, but I think largely because of that. So I think we, had, uh, we developed a very efficient way to try to deal with commercial banks. And as you know, if a commercial bank uh, does get into trouble, we try to get it to Friday. One of the jokes we, we had at the Fed is instead of TGIF, it was, um, thank God it's Friday, it was Friday, the beginning of the work week. Uh, <laughs> because we get institutions to Friday and then try to deal with them before they open up markets in Asia uh, on Monday morning, which was 7 p.m. Uh, Washington time. So we had a large number of, uh, of board meetings on, on Sunday to try to make sure that we got things resolved before, uh, before the, uh, the markets in Japan opened. But I think trying to, uh, to, to, to get out of that situation, we have something that is much more syst um, systematic in how things are dealt with. Just like with bank deposits, people don't worry that um, they won't be able to get their money out. 
We've had uh, a number of bank failures, and in each case, it's been uh, very easy for people to get their uh, insured deposits out, completely smooth operations, no problems with the ATM machines. And you have that kind of certainty about how you're going to be dealt with, that actually helps to reduce a lot of the, um, uh, the problems in, in the markets. It prevents what I often say from uh, uh, the, uh, if an institution goes down, from the ripple effect becoming a full-blown tidal wave. It also addresses partially this concern about institutions being too interconnected to fail. It used to be too big to fail, but we've seen that some institutions that really weren't especially large also potentially had these same kind of ripple effects turning into tidal waves. And I think if we had much greater certainty about how the contracts were going to be dealt with, much greater certainty about resolving these, these institutions, it wouldn't cause, it wouldn't make the, the situation as fragile. We wouldn't have to have as, uh, as many interventions as, uh, as, we, uh, as we have had. And, uh, and then getting back to the, the second piece of what, what Jill had asked about the coordination among the regulators, it's an incredible alphabet soup, not only in the US, but worldwide. And these risks were being taken worldwide. I mean, you talked about some of the issues in subprime, but uh, you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the Bulgarians. Well, I'm going to mention the Hungarians and, uh, and the Poles. I'm actually um, uh, part, uh, part Hungarian. Uh, Krosner's a Hungarian name. And in Hungary and in Poland, what individuals were doing is they were taking out long-term mortgages, you know, their 15-year long mortgages, and said, well, you know, the interest rates are pretty high in the local currency, in the Forint and the Zloty. So why not take the, um, uh, the loans out in Swiss francs or in Japanese yen, where interest rates are very close to zero? Well, that's really great in the short run, but what happens if the, flor the forint and the zloty fall in value relative to the yen and the, uh, the Swiss franc, which is exactly what happened last fall. You had a 40, 50% decrease. Now, we were concerned about payment shock of 2 or 3% with subprime loans. This is 40 or 50% payment shock. So these risks were being taken all over the globe. And I think a broad rethink of uh, risk management that is going to take much better coordination amongst the agencies, and probably it's better to have fewer agencies trying to coordinate, would be extremely valuable. You would say the Fed and the SEC should still exist, though. <laughs> yeah, <just> kidding. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you talk about, you know, we, we can't talk about the crisis without talking about that weekend in September. and. Uh, Lehman Brothers' failure and, and how that occurred and how the ripple effects really seem to take a really bad situation and push us off into a cliff, into an, an unknown uh, arena. And I guess that, you know, the, the question about regulation is also a dicey question because we want to make sure that these companies can thrive and, and do business and, and, you know, contribute to the capitalist uh, spirit that we've built here and across the globe. So, Annette, how do you see... The, the intersection of regulation and markets or, or just business in general. How do we create a system that is livable, breathable, flexible enough to let these endeavors continue? They're great, you know, many, Lehman Brothers used to be a great business. So how do, we, how do we keep them afloat and, you know, but also regulate them better? Well, that's a good question. You know, there, Dick Grasso, who's, you don't hear his name too much anymore. We don't dare mention him, but Dick Grasso used to say there's a difference between free markets and free-for-all markets. Mm. And that, in a sense, is what you're trying to achieve with regulation, is that sweet spot where you don't have free-for-all markets, and free markets can operate, but in a more rational, somewhat more controlled environment. And uh, that is the challenge, obviously, in a period as we're coming up now, because there's going to be a strong incentive on the part of a lot of people to go to the other extreme and to overregulate. And I think even those who are strong believers in regulation, as I am, are worried that we not go too far in the other direction. But it is going to be um, very important, I think, to have uh, a focus on systemic risk. And I think, as Randy said, if, I think we're going to have to identify those firms that are either too big to fail, as in they could bring everybody down with them, or too uh, interconnected to fail, where their failure could have a negative effect on other uh, participants all over the marketplace, and decide for those institutions what are the additional controls that are going to have to be put in place. Um, I don't think that they're particularly happy about this, but there may be an overlay of additional capital requirements or a much ev in even more closer scrutiny to things like leverage, uh, risk management, and the like, to really make sure that those institutions, while they can function competitively, and it's not just going to be 
domestic competition, but international competition that's going to be so important, but that they can do that in a way that we feel is not putting the whole system at risk. I mean, it's pretty clear that what happened in this last period was that we had, you know, too many people chasing yield, too many uh, distortions of incentives, uh, you know, uh, risk was taken that was way, you know, disproportionate to what it should have been, uh, with, you know, compensation practices that unfortunately encouraged that. The more, the more risk you took and the higher the potential return, the more you could, you know, compensate yourself. And again, it was a sort of heads I win, tails you lose environment because those aren't the only people who lost. We all lost. I mean, you all lost in your 401ks. You lost in your uh, accounts. And so um, we cannot have a system going forward where that's the case. Well, Annette brought it up, so I'll turn that point to you about compensation, a nice hot button issue so we can get our pitchforks out and be really angry when people get paid a lot of money. But the reality is we have to figure out, or do we need to figure out how big a role government plays in defining compensation? And um, I would ask you to answer that in two, in two ways, Randy. Okay. The TARP recipients, so we're injecting money into certain firms. What kind of compensation rules do you think might be appropriate? And across the system, it looks like the Obama administration is very interested in trying to create some incentives for more rational compensation. So how can we do that? Those are really, really difficult questions, and I'm glad, uh, I'm sure Annette is very glad that you turned to me rather than that. Take care of that later. <laughs> no, but these, uh, I think the incentive issues are really at the core of a lot of um, the challenges that we saw. And as I mentioned, these incentive problems were happening, whether it's you know, the, the household in, in Hungary and in Poland who are taking these incredible risks, but either not fully realizing them or not caring about them, thinking that someone else is going to take care of them. Or at the major investment banks, you saw the same kind of risk being taken. We did this uh, senior supervisors group survey last, well, it was now two falls ago, in the fall of 2007, to try to understand what risk management practices were looking like at these different, uh, at these different firms. And they all had the right PowerPoint presentation that they had presented to the SEC and to the, the Federal Reserve on their risk management structures. And they had all of that exactly right, but the practice, the implementation was not there. And that is the real challenge because you would have thought that they would have enough incentive because in many cases they really did have their own money on the line. Even though they may have gotten big bonuses uh, early on, many of the people who did get big bonuses early on kept a fair amount of that in the stock of their firm. So even though they may still have done reasonably well after the failure of a firm, they still will have lost tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And, uh, but they didn't seem to take that, uh, take that into account as much as we would have expected them to do. So I think um, a, a broad rethink of corporate governance practices, thinking about best practices in corporate governance are extremely, extremely important. And that is partially a responsibility of the shareholders, partially a responsibility of various uh, private watchdog groups that do some of this already, but should become, should become more active. And I think now getting to the other part of your question about recipients of, uh, of uh, government money, I think obviously there's a different responsibility. If you're taking taxpayer money, you have a different responsibility to the taxpayer than uh, if, um, if you are, uh, are not taking government money. Now, it's uh, getting back to what Annette said about getting the sweet spot right, it's very important still to maintain incentives to maintain good employees. Because if the government is now an, a part owner of some of these institutions, you don't want to have such draconian uh, caps on, uh, on compensation or such um, uh, so low incentives that the good people leave those institutions and work elsewhere, because that will only reduce the value of the investment for the, uh, uh, for, for the firm. So it's very difficult to sort of get that right. I do think that the responsibilities are different, but I don't think it means just sort of capping salaries very, very low and having no incentives, because you do want to have incentives to keep the good people at those institutions to make sure that the taxpayer is well paid back, and in some cases, potentially even make some, uh, some money for the taxpayer off of this. Oh, money for the taxpayer? That sounds good to me. Um, we're going to ask a couple more questions up here, and then I want you all to be putting your thinking caps on, because we're going to have a Q&A here. So as you just let some things percolate, we're going to ask a couple. We'll just be here. You just keep thinking. Um, and, no uh, sleeping in the back, right? Exactly. Yeah. I see that. I feel like Kermit Champa is going to come out here and like uh -huh. yell at me. Uh, OK, so Annette, we're talking about basically blowing up our thought process, not the institutions themselves. 
And I get all, I personally get very anxious when I see congressional subcommittees grilling either CEOs or grilling regulators. And I get the sense that there could be this process of incremental rulemaking, that as a result of this, this horrible crisis, that to make a point and to sort of make it seem like you're a congressperson doing something, they do little things at a time. How do we avoid that? How do we avoid Congress kind of pushing their nose into a, obviously a system that they didn't have any idea about because they were part of the process on the way in, and now we're shaking a finger at everyone on the way out. So how do we how do we get around that part? Well, that's the that's a very difficult question because um, what it relies upon is Congress acting in the best interests of the electorate. And uh, now, why did that get a laugh? So obvious, <laughs> and not in their their own best interest. And let me explain that to you a little bit. I've always said that one of the lowest of the lowest low hanging fruits on regulatory reform is to combine the SEC with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. And the reason for that is because when the agent when the CFTC was formed in the 1970s their functions were really quite different because the, co the <coughs> commodity futures market was an agricultural market primarily. It was futures on corn and wheat. In the last several years, in the last 30 years, uh, we're now at the point where about 97% of all futures are financial futures that are virtually indistinguishable from securities. And yet you have two agencies, the rules are different, uh, the markets operate very differently. I happen to think that the securities markets are much more competitive markets for a variety of reasons. We have multiple competing markets for securities in the U.S., and we have a, a much more um, monopolistic markets in the futures markets. But in any case, um, that seems to me one of the easiest ways to rationalize regulation. That is a virtual impossibility. Uh, and I think Congress has already said that notwithstanding this crisis and this opportunity that the crisis has presented, that they are likely to put off that decision until 2011. Why is that? It's because the oversight committees for the SEC and the CFTC are in two different committees of Congress, and the financial services industry, not surprisingly, is one of the most generous on financial contributions. And therefore, on both sides of the aisle, nobody, they're nonpartisan. Right. Yeah, and they are nonpartisan. Right. So nobody wants to give up a seat on a committee that is important to their ability to run a political campaign. And um, so that's really tragic. And I'm not even sure that a PCORA commission, or, or what, whatever we're going to call the next one, um, will be able to resolve that. So that is you know, a bit of the disappointment here. What, what really should be happening and what we would hope comes out of Treasury in the, last, uh, in the next couple of weeks is some sort of a template for what the administration is thinking of in terms of uh, regulatory restructuring. I mean, it could have been really quite profound. Um, I don't know, again, whether politically they think that is feasible. If you really stop and think about what are the major functions that we, I mean, just think about it as if you were drawing up on a blank piece of paper, what is it we're trying to accomplish? I mean, we, want, we care about systemic risk, right? We care about the whole system mm -hmm. and that nobody is putting the whole system at risk. And then we care on a more micro level about safety and soundness of individual institutions, that no institution goes down. So we're worried about their capital positions and the like. And then we're worried about business conduct investor protection, disclosure, things of that nature. And that's why you hear about this, um, this phrase called the Twin Peaks, you know, that in a, in a rational world you would try to divide things as well as you could between the safety and soundness of an institution and the business conduct, investor protection, transparency regimes. That would argue in favor of taking any number of regulators who perform those roles and and sort of bringing them together. Um, and that would be, you know, very profound and, and could be very effective. But again, when you have 75 years of history, and as you say, nobody, nobody wants to give up, uh, you know, their own agency. Somebody said a joke the other day, something about that um, regulatory reform is like heaven. Uh, you know, everybody believes in it, but nobody wants to go there themselves. <laughs> um, 
Someone else needs to go first. Somebody yes. else needs to go first. Go first. Yeah. Something like that. So, uh, and boy, that is very much the case. So the, the, don't underestimate the importance that politics plays in regulatory reform. That's already depressing. Oh, All right, now you're training for, to me for optimism. I'm going for you for optimism, my Bulgarian pessimist here. Um, you know, I, I always think about, uh, you, you brought up the globe and, and the globalization, and, and you know, a lot of people here don't realize there's a big difference between the way regulatory structures, say, in Great Britain and the United States, that, you know, one is principles-based, one is rules-based, and how, how, but really both systems failed, right? So here's the question for you. Uh, is there a move afoot uh, to, to go one way or the other? And if, if we're going to be principled, we're going to sort of adhere to principles and have more flexibility in that respect, does that mean that small stuff gets missed? Or is it really, and if we are going to be rules-based, then how do we make sure that we, we just don't keep making rules? And if it's deregulation, by the way, do you, you know, deregulation couldn't have been the answer anyway. And, because we actually had tons of regulation in the 70s, and it didn't prevent crisis from occurring. So where do we go with that notion of sort of big picture, rules versus principles? Uh, that's, that's a really good question, which has been debated for a long time in accounting. Uh, uh, Annette and I both served on the, the uh, Financial Stability Forum, I guess now the Financial Stability Board, uh, an international body where we would be debating exactly these issues for accounting, for insurance regulation, for capital regulation, for a whole variety of things. And we haven't come to, uh, uh, to a resolution because it's, um, the ideas of, of uh, principle-based regulation are very attractive because you just sort of set out the broad principles and then that allows you the flexibility as markets change, as institutions change, to respond to that. But the problem is that once you enunciate the principle, the ways in which the markets change, the institutions change, will be to try to get around that principle. <laughs> And so there's a, it's very, very difficult, but it's exactly the same thing with the concrete rules, because often you start with the, rule, the, the principles, then you see people getting around it, you put these specific rules down, then they figure out ways to get around that. And that's, that's I think, the ultimate challenge of the, uh, the supervisor is in the implementation, because you can, you know, the, the regulators will never be able to keep up with the innovations that the private markets can come up with. You sit down a bright line rule, the markets will figure out how to, uh, to, to get, get around that. And that, in, in and of itself, is not necessarily a bad thing. But if you get back to that Neil Ferguson quote, if you set them up in such ways that there are these gaps where getting around them creates more, uh, more risk, such as giving incentives to do everything off balance sheet, which the old, uh, the very old capital regime did. I think the newer capital regime, Basel II, wouldn't have that same, uh, same incentive. But uh, the older one did. You can get into a worse situation than, than otherwise. And so, um, uh, I'm not giving you a direct answer because I think we're still debating these kinds of things on principles versus rules. But I think the, the key uh, is, is what you, you ended with. is It's not necessarily having more regulation. Because many of the markets that had challenges were some of the most regulated markets in the world. It's having good regulation, regulation that makes sense, that's compatible with the way markets operate. Because if you try to do it too far against the way markets operate, you can get into these situations where people try to get around it and cause more risk. If you understand how they're going to operate and sort of see, okay, this is how they would do it, let's try to take that into account, and then let's try to be very vigilant in the actual implementation and supervision of being aware of where they're trying to get, a, going to get around these things. And, and I think that's really where, when the rubber hits the road, what you have to do. It's not the formal rules and regulations themselves, but the implementation, making sure that the, the different uh, supervisors around the world have good information flow. You don't have this um, balkanization, I guess this is kind of our theme here, of the different regulators, both within a country and across countries, so people don't know that an institution may be taking incredible risks, but it's outside the normal regulatory ambit. So insurance companies, for example, um, I can think of one in particular which was taking a lot of risks, but it wasn't in the usual regulatory ambit. The information wasn't flowing to, to the other regulators. I think if that had been on a formal exchange, all of those, those over-the-counter um, uh, products that were not on an exchange but just traded um, uh, just by telephone, if it had been more centralized on an exchange, which is perfectly consistent with good, good market practices, uh, both the exchanges and regulators would have had a better idea about uh, what was going on. So I think it's much more in the implementation and the information than in uh, the particulars of the rules or that we need more rules. It's just we need better ones, we need better information. All right, now we are going to open this up to you, our fantastic attendees. Chris, you
<laughs> well, no, it's, I mean, it's in terms of the incentive, it's not the level, uh, but it should think about, is there an incentive to take excessive risk? And I wish I could give you a simple formula to say that, you know, if alpha is more than 0.2, that's too much. It's, well, one, I don't think the, um, the economics or the finance of those incentives have, uh, have given us that kind of uh, specificity. There's no, like, gas constant or something that in Barris and Holly Hall, uh, where the, uh, a lot of the sciences are, we would have, would have learned those, uh, those numbers. So I can't give you those specifics, and I don't think it's a good idea to get into that level of, of micromanagement. I think there has to be some judgment but I think there has to be a focus to make sure that the, uh, the supervisors, whether it's in the securities industry, insurance industry, or, uh, or uh, banking industry, are focused on exactly that, that issue. Can I say, yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I think one of the problems with being too specific on what your parameters are, is, as Randy has indicated before, people figure out other ways to work around it. Um, and so one of the issues is, you know, what is it that what do we need to put in place to create the right incentive? And so normally what you look at is better disclosure so everybody sees what's going on. And then I think when it comes to things like corporate governance, I think it's been, for too long, it's been sort of an academic discussion, an academic exercise, as opposed to saying what tools do shareholders need to express their voice better based on what they're seeing? Should all shareholders have the right to vote for say on pay? Should they be able to say, we think this is these compensation practices are out of line? Should shareholders be able to have uh, access to the proxy and to be able to put their questions to the pro on the proxy statement that other shareholders can vote on? Those kinds of things have been debated and debated and debated. And I think finally in this crisis, we're seeing legislation mm -hmm. be proposed, we're mm -hmm. seeing you know, Mary Shapiro at the SEC put it on the SEC's agenda and calling the question again. So I think a lot of this isn't, is it, it's not the Goldilocks principle, right? Is it too much? Is it too little? It's over time can, can reasonable people look at these practices and express their voice and make a change. If they don't like it, do they throw the board out and put different people on? That's really the only way to do it. I think if you just set particular targets, you'll probably fail. So this man is going to jump out of the seat if you're <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm just going to, people in the back of my neck here, the question really is, should banks be able to, if they're going to be backed up by the government, if there is going to be that safety net of the government, government coming in, should those same banks be able to do, conduct what is called proprietary trading, which is if, if you are Goldman Sachs, you can trade with the company's money for the company itself. So proprietary trading would mean we own a company, you're our customers, but we also get to trade for ourselves. So what do you think about the proprietary trading? I mean, obviously, that's where the most of the compensation has gone from prop trading desks was really where most of the money was made. In, in some institutions, not in, in all. That was in some, uh, yeah. in some cases. And, and that's, of course, where the governance practices and uh, the compensation practices have been um, probably least, uh, least effective and, and the risk management practices uh, least effective. And so um, I think you have to allow for some proprietary trading because that's a very important complement to the, the activities of a financial institution. I think um, it would make um, doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of activities much more expensive. And even if you sort of narrowly said, okay, deposit-taking institutions couldn't do this, you could still have uh, system-wide problems, the two interconnected fail problem coming from those right on the edge. And so if you, and this gets back to what I was talking about before, you know, you set this bright line rule, so let's say deposit-taking institutions um, can't do that, then you'll get the, um, uh, in the penumbra, you will get a lot of institutions doing deposit-like things, doing things that will cause potentially um, system-wide risk, and we'd still have to deal with them. So I think that is not going to be the, uh, the, the magic bullet, but I don't know, maybe in that Well, I know, I know that this concept has been discussed, and Paul Volcker is uh, very much uh, interested in raising the dialogue on this issue. I do think, again, that we are going to have to be cognizant of any limitations like that that we put on any U.S. institutions and what the implications are going to be for their ability to compete in a worldwide environment. I mean, that, I mean, that is the opposite of the way, certainly, uh, banks, I think, worldwide had gone. In effect, our banks were competing against these major 
you know, wholesale banks uh, in Europe. And so, uh, and I think as Randy suggests, you know, you're, what you'll do is just create other places where um, other institutions that are not subject to those limitations will sort of compete in their space, so to speak. But it does raise an issue about things like deposit insurance. I mean, if the government is uh, insuring certain activities, then you know, should those activities be done in some sort of isolated mm. entity that can be sort of spun off or segregated for purposes of the U.S. backstop? So I think there's a lot to consider, but I'm not quite sure at this point what the answer is. Yes, sir. I mean, this is uh, this is an area where uh, uh, the Fed exercised its um, its authorities to try to put some protections on the um, parts of the market, and so we were trying to thread the needle that, uh, which is a very very difficult one to do. It's it's a rather thick piece of thread and a very fine uh, fine eye in the needle to make sure to to have consumer protection, but not prevent innovation and not prevent people who might want to uh, take a different type of mortgage uh, that might actually make a lot of sense for them to allow them to do that, but at the same time people who may not understand or um, it's too easy to try to bamboozle some people may not have had the experiences with, uh, with financial services to take something that they, uh, they can't, uh, can't work with. So what we tried to do is say that some of these rules that we were applying would apply only to so-called high co cost mortgages, that is to subprime mortgages so that uh, people with um, longer credit histories, with better credit histories, who might be more likely to have better knowledge, uh, they would be able to choose uh, among a wider variety of products. Um, but at, uh, in certain areas where people, because people with lower uh, credit scores typically have shorter credit histories, maybe not as much experience in, in credit or more, less, um, less sophistication in, in credit, have more protections there. But it's a very, very difficult thing, and you're exactly right. Uh, just like I talked about before, of taking some of these over-the-counter products, some of these, these uh, contracts, the so-called derivatives, putting them on exchanges, that's very good when they're all exactly the same. But when you have a lot of innovation, um, you, that often takes place in the over-the-counter markets. People are kind of coming up with new ideas, trying different things out. We don't want to stop that, but we also don't want that to cause a problem for the system. And trying to thread that needle and get that balance right is very, very difficult. So we tried in the mortgage rules we, we put out over time as they're implemented. We'll see if we've left enough flexibility so that you can uh, do a mortgage that makes sense for you. Uh, but others who may not be able to have the same sophistication that you have uh, will be protected from, uh, from some of the, uh, uh, the practices that could lead them to make very bad choices. You know, one of the big challenges as a securities regulator is, you know, that at base we always believe that the more you tell people, the better off they are. I mean, transparency is, you know, the great mantra. But having said that, as you've seen and you implied it when you talked about the mortgage documentation, you can give people, and we seem to in some instances, almost unlimited amounts of data that is incomprehensible. <laughs> and so Just look at any economics paper. Right. <laughs> so the lawyers are happy, because the, particularly the lawyers for the intermediary, who know that if you sue, they'll be able to say, but it was right there on page 62 in the fine print. I think we really are going to have to have a sea change in terms of how we view disclosure to particularly retail investors. And it seems to me that with the internet now and with, you know, with computers, you can, you can layer the disclosure. So you can say, tell me the quick and dirty. In two pages, what do I need to know? And show me the skull and crossbones if it should be there. And then, but if I want more information and I, if I'm more sophisticated, that I can keep clicking through until ultimately, you know, you'll be at the level that Randy Krosner is, when he's you know, trying to figure out you know, how do they model this when they d decided to price it. So you could be entitled to everything because we're, we're a very democratized marketplace. right? And that's one of the things that's happened here is we've decided all people are equal, we're a democratic society, but we're really not all equal in terms of what we can comprehend in this stuff. And so we need to, to fashion this in a way that is digestible to people all along the spectrum and depending on their interests. And I think if we did that, and we did it not just in securities products, and that's why I think it's a mistake just to limit this dialogue to agencies, fragmented agencies in this balkanized system, but to say across the board for similar kinds of 
products that have similar types of economics, how would one effectively convey to people what it is they're buying, what they're getting, what the risks are and what the rewards are so they can intelligently make a decision? All right, let's see. Hold on, I'm looking around, I'm looking around. <laughs> Madam, you are the last question. <laughs>Uh, the moral hazard question. Yes. Go for it, Randy. All right, well, you've asked me to, to address each question first. I don't know if that's oh, I'm fair. Sorry. I'm happy to allow uh, I uh, think Annette the lawyer to do that. Likes to wait and see okay, what no, no, I'm, I'm happy to do react it. to it. No, but this is this is the classic moral hazard problem that um, that if you intervene and provide the safety net there, people are going to take more risks because they know that if they're at the edge of the cliff, they'll be held harmless if they, they fall over the cliff. So they're going to take a lot more risks. They're going to get much closer to to the edge. And, and that was certainly one of the challenges we had when I was, uh, the three years that I was at the Fed, because there were institutions that you know, were on the, the verge of, uh, of failure or got into trouble. And the question was, would we try to do something to cushion the blow? Now, we really wanted to try to focus on cushioning the blow for the markets, of having that ripple effect of the, uh, the institution going down and turning into the tidal wave. And so this, this system-wide uh, system risk issues. But as much as possible, you want to give the right incentives for people to make the choices that they don't take those risks. They have their own money on the line, and they, they don't want to, and they shouldn't be taking certain types of, uh, types of risks. And um, I'm not sure that uh, we have gotten the, the line exactly right. This is going to be one of the big debates in the systemic risk regulator, because that's going to, um, as, as Annette said, cast the safety net potentially much wider than just commercial banks, but to a larger set of, of institutions that potentially could come into a federal safety net. And that means that potentially they could take more risks and not have to fully pay for it. And we have to be really mindful of that, because rather than making the markets and the system more robust, we can make it a lot weaker. I haven't given you um, a, a specific answer, because I don't know where the exact line is. But this, I think, is one of the underlying principles that we're going to have to deal with and the Congress is going to have to deal with in thinking about regulatory reform. I'll just say that somewhere before Lehman Brothers is probably where we should have drawn the line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, going back to a point that Randy had made earlier, I mean, one of the reasons why the administration is now focused not just on the, having a systemic risk regulator, but bolstering this concept of resolution authority, which is really wind-down authority for major systemically important institutions, is for that reason. As you know, uh, as I'm sure you felt, you know, there was a lot of anger in the country about where we are with AIG and the you know, billions of dollars that you know, continually got poured into AIG. Why didn't we let them fail? And the, the answer was because they were systemically important and we didn't have a mechanism in place to figure out how to do that effectively. We didn't have the mechanisms like we do to resolve banks. We don't have an FDIC for these you know, holding companies of large financial institutions. So by focusing on that, the thought is that we will also be in a position where we will let these institutions fail, but to do it in a way that is not harmful to the rest of the system. So first, we're going to try to prevent them from failing by having systemic risk oversight. And then if they do fail, we'll have, have more tools to let that happen in a way that doesn't bring everybody else down at the same time. I want to thank everybody for showing up here. I also want to give a, <laughs> a big round of applause to Chrissy Law Blanchard, who pulled this entire event together. <laughs> Pembroke Center and it's just awesome. And of course to Annette Nazareth and to Randy Krosner who were fantastic and brilliant. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>